Welcome to a very special two-parter episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you're watching this channel, you're probably aware of the 737 MAX fiasco. Well, back in the 1990s, Boeing went through something very similar, but much worse. This video is part one of two, and in these videos, we're going to be taking a look at what brought down two airlines and almost brought down a third. Now, I know that this has been talked about ad nauseum on YouTube and elsewhere. So in this first video, we'll be looking at the crash of United Airlines Flight 585. Now, like I said, this has been talked about a lot, but there's actually a first investigative report because the true cause of this crash was not revealed until much later. It's absolutely fascinating to see how these investigators worked with the information that they had, and they got so close to cracking the case. Before I forget, make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss part two when it drops. So without further ado, this is the story of United Airlines Flight 585. On the 3rd of March, 1991, a Boeing 737 was to fly from Denver to Colorado Springs. On that day, the 737 would be piloted by Captain Harold Green, who had 9,900 hours of flight time, and First Officer Patricia Edison who had 3,900 hours of experience. When the pilots were at Denver, they got a weather update. The weather was okay at Colorado Springs. A mechanic then walked around the plane. He found that an electronics equipment door was left open, and so he closed it. He noted no other problems with the plane. Flight 585 departed Denver at 9.23 a.m. for the short flight to Colorado Springs. While en route, the pilot sent an ACARS message letting United staff know that they'd arrive in Colorado Springs by 9.42 a.m. instead of 9.46 a.m. In the cockpit, the pilots were listening to an automated weather report, and it wasn't good. There were wind shear alerts, and the wind gusts were strong, so they decided to add 20 knots to their landing speed to account for the increased winds. ATC then guided them away from a beacon known as Springs VOR towards runway 35. They'd be making a visual approach, and so the pilots started to bring the plane down from 10,000 feet. Soon, they were at 8,500 feet. The first officer commented that they could see the runway, and the controller asked them to maintain 8,500 feet till they got the all clear. The first officer then contacted the tower, who then cleared them to land. The controller warned them about the wind that was gusting up to 29 knots. The first officer wanted to know if other planes had trouble landing that day. She got to know that another 737 that had just landed before them experienced an increase in speed by up to 20 knots right before touchdown. She replied with, Sounds adventurous, uh, United 585. Thank you. As they descended, the first officer kept an eye out for some traffic that was supposed to be in the area. In the background, the controller said, after landing, hold short of runway 30 for departing traffic on runway 30. The first officer replied with, We'll hold short of runway 30, United 585. This transmission was the last one received from Flight 585. The plane then suddenly lurched to the right as it began to dive towards the ground. Witnesses on the ground looked on in shock as Flight 585 lost altitude. In the cockpit, the sudden upheaval caught both pilots off guard. The first officer said, oh God, as the captain increased power and called for flaps 15. They were trying to go around, but it wasn't a B. The nose of flight 585 dropped. The plane sped up to 200 knots and everyone on board was subjected to four Gs of force. It never recovered. Flight 585 slammed into the ground and none of the 25 people on board survived. The plane was destroyed. The investigators had good news and bad news. The good news was that the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder had survived. But the flight data recorder only recorded a few basic parameters like speed, heading, altitude, etc. It wasn't as thorough as the data recorders of today. But even with that limited data, they could see how violently Flight 585 went off course. Combined with a ton of eyewitness testimonies from people near the airport, they were able to piece together the final moments of Flight 585. Armed with what the plane did, the investigators went and looked at the history of the plane. 
The plane had a few maintenance-related write-ups, as most planes do. I mean, planes are mechanical, and mechanical things break all the time. Some pilots complained about engine number one being too slow to respond. Some pilots complained about the CAT2 system not working properly. And some pilots complained about the rudder. They talked to the pilots who experienced the rudder upset. Apparently, in one case, the plane was climbing and it was between 10,000 and 12,000 feet. And the plane just yawed to the right as the plane was climbing. This happened on the 25th of February, 1991. Just two days later, this happened again. The pilots in that case had to disconnect the yaw damper and they then pulled the circuit breaker. This plane had some serious problems. But the rudder wasn't their only suspect. The wind that day was quite bad and they had plenty of data to show how gusty it was. The investigators then started to see if winds could have played a part in the crash. According to their data, they knew that Flight 585 was experiencing a moderate amount of turbulence that day right before the crash. They looked at the data for another 737 that had landed before Flight 585. As it approached the runway, it encountered some strong winds, but nothing strong enough to knock it out of the air. They then looked to see if a vortex could have formed that could have interfered with Flight 585. There were mountains nearby, and the winds coming off of those mountains could be quite strong. In fact, people in the area did report winds so strong that it broke off tree branches and inflicted some damage to some cars. A glider instructor said that they had been having some very strong vortexes that day. So the investigators called in NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They took the data from the altimeter and tried to calculate the strength of the vortex that Flight 585 flew through. If any, that is. You see, if a plane flew through a vortex, then it would show up as altitude changes on the flight data recorder, as the pressure of the air would vary as the plane penetrated the vortex. Their analysis was inconclusive. There were eyewitness reports of strong vortexes in the area, but the flight data recorder just didn't show much of a change in the plane's altitude. They compared Flight 585's altitude data to that of Delta 191, a plane that had been brought down by a microburst. Compared to Flight 585, 191's altitude was all over the place. But that doesn't mean that Flight 585 did not fly into a vortex. It could be the case that Flight 585 flew into a vortex at a place where the pressure change was relatively small. They had two solid theories, but not enough data to back either one up. So with that, they took to the simulators. NOAA had calculated that the plane had flown through a vortex that was 1,600 feet in diameter, with wind speeds in the core reaching 100 feet per second. They found that such a vortex wouldn't impact the plane's controllability all that much, so they kept increasing the intensity of the vortex. They found that strong vortices could cause a problem with airplane controllability. If recovery procedures were not carried out in that situation, then the plane could theoretically crash. They were still at square one though. Two good theories, not enough data. So they theorized that a confluence of two or more factors brought down Flight 585. Think about it. As Flight 585 approached the airport, a vortex or a disturbance of some sort could have caused the plane to bank to the left a bit. This would cause the pilot to correct to the right. Then, if the wind suddenly reversed, the inputs made by the pilot would just put the plane into a right bank, and from there, it wouldn't take too much for the pilots to lose control. In addition to that, if the rudder malfunctioned, then these pilots would not stand a chance. But unfortunately, the investigators were not able to nail down the cause of this crash. There just wasn't enough information. Here's a quote from the report. In conclusion, the safety board could not rule out a possible combination of events that was the cause of the loss of control and subsequent crash. Similarly, there was insufficient evidence to support such a combination of events as causal. Basically, they were saying that they had an idea as to what brought down Flight 585, 
but they couldn't conclusively prove it beyond the shadow of a doubt. Just yet, they needed their smoking gun. But within about 21 months, the investigation was wrapped up and nothing really was done as the investigation was inconclusive. But within two years, in 1994, the case of United Flight 585 would be back in the spotlight because another jet would go down. That's it for part one. Hope you enjoyed it. In your opinion, do you think that the investigators had what they needed to solve this case? Because at this point, you now know everything that the investigators knew in the end of 1992. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. In part two, we'll be taking a look at the underlying cause for this accident from the perspective of another crash, that is US Air Flight 427. We'll look at how they missed the underlying flaw the first time around. If you're watching this video in the distant future, you can find a link to part two on your screen right now, or you can find it in the link in the description. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.